Well, first of all, I'd like to thank people for coming. This is actually the second for public forum that we've had on this project. The first one was in 2015, um, and it was over at the Hobart William Smith campus, and uh, it was well attended, and I thank people for coming again to hear about what we are doing and why we are doing it. Let's and thank Jan for the introduction as well. So the insect that, that I've been working on for, gosh, since I was a graduate student a long time ago, um, is the diamondback moth. The diamondback moth is one of the world's most damaging insect pests. It's a very small insect. It's only about the size of two grains of rice put together, but the larvae uh, can do a tremendous amount of damage. In fact, it's estimated that this particular insect costs uh, farmers and consumers about four to five billion dollars per year. Uh, it's also one of the insects that evo has evolved resistance to most every insecticide that has been used against us, against it. So how does this relate to New York agriculture? Well, in vegetables, uh, Steve Reiners puts together a, a table every year uh, of the vegetables. Cabbage is the number one vegetable grown in, in New York. Uh, as a crucifer and adding this with cauliflower, that's 80 to 100 million dollars a year. And as in the past, uh, even this, this year, we've seen farmers have to plow under fields that were just overtaken by diamondback moths. So it is a pest of importance, not only globally, but also in New York State. Question is, how should we control this, this pest? Well, most of the time, as Jan says, you know, our integrated pest management programs are reliant very heavily on insecticides. Um, insecticides have done wonderful uh, things for controlling insects and uh, and human uh, and medically important insects. The types of insecticides that growers have available to them are pyrethroids. In the case of uh, commercial growers, uh, organic growers use pyrethrum. It's the same active ingredient. Neonicotinoids, we've certainly heard them in the press about problems with uh, pollinator decline. Uh, spinosins, okay, that's a class of insecticide came in about 15 years ago. Organic growers and conventional growers can use it. Growth regulators, Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, and a whole series of other organic compounds. Again, the diamondback moth has become resistant to many, many of these insecticides, conventional and organic. Is there another way that we can try and control this insect pest? Well, many in the audience, I think, will remember, uh, know, recognize this person, Rachel Carson, who wrote a book called Silent Spring in 1962. And Silent Spring uh, was, it still is a major factor in the environmental movement today. And it was one of the reasons that I got into the profession of applied entomology. Rachel Carson, in the last chapter of her book, she talks about a way forward. She talks about using an insect's life forces to destroy it. She's talking about the mating uh, ability of an insect. And if you can turn that around, it can actually be a control program in called, what's called the male sterilization technique, or more commonly, the sterile insect technique. So this was kind of a wild idea back in the 1950s but it worked out incredibly well. This is the way this particular technique works. An insect controls itself in an environmentally friendly way. The males are sterilized through radiation. You release these sterile males, they mate with pest females. There's no offspring produced and the local population crashes. Sounds pretty good. And it's been very successful uh, in some uh, situations. This is the 
American screw worm is about the size of a house fly, and it lays its eggs in the open wounds of cattle. It's mainly a pest in the southern part of the U.S. and then throughout Latin America. These eggs hatch, the larvae burrow into the wound, they go into the muscle, muscle tissue and the organs and uh, debilitate the animals. For livestock, it also goes to, to pets, companion animals, also goes to people too. The idea was that a couple of people had was, why don't you sterilize these males and release them in a band right here in the southern part of the US and as these females and males are coming up to try and attack the, the, the animals in this area, you have a band and all the females can, can choose from is actually the radiated sterile males and then the population crashes. It's been very, very successful. It saves about a billion dollars per year and no insecticides are used. There's also examples of the same technology being used for med flies and teetsy flies, um, you know, which, are, which transmit sleeping disease. So this is a technology that has been very, very successful. It's a proven approach, it's species specific. So if you release a, a screw worm, it's only gonna mate with another screw worm. It's not gonna mate with a monarch butterfly or anything else like that. So it's species specific. It's IPM compatible, it's insecticide free. The problem with using radiation, though, is kind of like using a sledgehammer. When you expose the insects to radiation, they might become sterile, but they also may not be able to fly. And in 1990, I worked with the Atomic Energy Agency to try and come up with a sterile insect program for diamondback moth. We could not get one. However, with genetic engineering, we can have a self-limiting uh, use of genetics, and this is what I'm going to be talking about later, specifically with diamondback moth. When you have something like this, the gene disappears rapidly, there's no harm from radiation. You can release just males, which are harmless. In the pro program with uh, the screw worm, actually you end up releasing males and females and hope that all of the females are also sterile. You can also put a color marking marker into the, into the insect so we can follow its population uh, over time. And the mating-based approach can address a wide range of pest species. I'm going to give you, I'm going to talk mostly about diamondback moth, but as Jan pointed out, we have other species like the spotted wing drosophila that might be very amenable to this technology. So what we have in this self-limiting diamondback moth basically contains two genes. One is a self-limiting gene that gets inherited. The female offspring do not survive into adulthood, and therefore the population crashes. After the releases are stopped, the genes disappear. There's also a, a fluorescent marker gene, which allows the self-limiting uh, insects to be followed over time in the population. It also allows an estimation of the population uh, sizes. So this is the real difference between, you know, the, the wild type diamondback moth and the genetically engineered one. So I got quite intrigued by this idea when I heard Luke Alfie from uh, Oxitech, which is a spin-off company from Oxford University, went to an entomology meeting and he was talking about using this self-limiting gene. And afterwards I, I talked with him and said, you know, we have an insect that is very, very difficult to control, the diamondback moth. Let's talk about developing a project. And eventually this was how the project developed. We've taken this research in a very stepwise fashion. First of all, we want to do it in the, in the greenhouse. And this is an example of some tests that were run at Cornell University in my lab and also at Rothamsted Experiment Station in the UK. So we have a population of diamondback moth humming along, just reproducing in these large cages. And then we introduce the Oxitec uh, self-limiting diamondback moths, and then we see the population crash. 
looking at the evidence here, it indicates to us that, yeah, maybe this is really worth evaluating further. So the next idea is trying to take it to the field. But let me just tell you what I see as Cornell's role in this. Cornell is uh, the land-grant university to the state of New York, and our former president said it's the land-grant university to the world as well. And we take that responsibility very seriously. What we do at Cornell, we develop technology, we also evaluate technology too because what we're trying to do is incorporate this into our agricultural production systems, into what Jan was referring to as integrated pest management. If, something, if the technology seems to work, we incorporate it into our, into our guidebook for, for crops. If it doesn't work, that's the end of it. So, in 2015, we conducted some trials in field cages out here, and this is at the experiment station. And let me go through specifically what we were evaluating, and then I'll talk about what we want to do in 2017. So the use of this technology, basically we wanted to know about its field biology. How long do the, do the moths live? Okay. If we get this kind of information, it'll tell us how frequently these self-limiting male releases should be made. If the, if the insect lives for one day, we might have to make more releases of it. If it lives for seven days, we can uh, make fewer releases of it. So we conducted a number of experiments to look at their longevity in the field, in, in these cages. And what we did is we had two types of males we had the Oxytec males and uh, what we call the, the non-engineered males. Put them in this cage. Then we caught males after three days and after seven days. Then we identified the males caught. We knew that the, uh, the engineered ones have a marker, the fluorescent marker, and the non-engineered ones do not. So equal numbers of capture after a certain period of time means they have the same longevity. And the result was that the male survival was very similar to in both the Oxytec and the non-Oxytec. We also wanted to look at, oops. We also wanted to look at how competitive for females are these moths. How, how well do they compete? That'll tell us how many male moths we might need to release to suppress a pest population. So again, in these field cages, we would introduce two types of moths, the engineered and non-engineered moths. We would release females. The, the males would mate with the females, and then we'd collect the offspring and identify the parent. Was it a self-limiting one or a wild type? Equal numbers would mean that they have the same competitiveness. The result was the competitive was a little bit lower with the self-limiting moss, but it was certainly within acceptable uh, levels for other sterile insect technique programs. So I think we were, we were pretty close there. Now the next one is, how does this translate into uh, diamondback moth control? So we use this information on mating competitiveness, lifespan, eggs, females, life history, put it into a population model and started looking at diamondback moth control. This is what would be expected. So the results, you can see if there's no moth of the, the self-limiting moths, if they're not released, you know, we have a spike in the population, the population is growing, we have another spike for the next generation, then we have a real high spike, okay? But if we release these insects, the self-limiting ones, you can see the line, the green line is right there. So it really shows us that these releases of these moths here prevent the population growth, okay? Good information. 
Next thing is to take it to a larger scale. And to do that, we have to go through a really rigorous, long-term uh, application process with USDA, their Biotechnology Regulatory Service, or BRS. So we prepared the, the dossier to submit to APHIS, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, which is part of USDA. And we submitted this March 16, 2016. They take about a year to evaluate it, and then they issue a draft environmental assessment and a preliminary FONSI. This is not the FONSI from, what's that TV show? This is a finding of no significant impact. Then there's a 30-day public comment period Biotechnology Regulatory Service considers all the comments and then they finalize environmental assessment and a FONSI, and this was done on June 22nd, and then they provided a permit on July 7th, 2017. So this is 16 months, 16 months, you know, for their evaluation. It's very thorough. Okay, so what do we want to do in 2017? Well, we had the approval by the federal government <coughs> by USDA, Cornell Institutional Biosafety Committee approved it. The dean had an external review who approved it, so allowing us to move forward. So now I'll talk about what we are proposing to do this year. We want, first of all, to have, to study this biology on a larger scale. In the first set of experiments, we are gonna co-release the the self-limiting moss here with wild-type males, and then we monitor their movement patterns in an eight-acre field of cabbage. This is a circular field of cabbage, and then these show all the different points here where we actually will be monitoring and capturing the moss. So this will tell us their movement patterns. We're gonna conduct a second set of experiments too where we do pretty much the same thing, but we put sentinel females out at various parts in the field, and then we look at the parentage of those mated females. And in both trials, we will monitor for insects outside the field. So this gives just an illustration of what we're gonna be doing. It's a mark, release, recapture. So we release the, the moss. They're marked also with colored powder, or fluorescent. Then we recapture them on traps. And we look at the dispersal and lifespan, which can be estimated through the distance travel and the capture time since release. Then the second set of experiments, we have females, uh, virgin females who are out in the field and they have their wings clipped and they can't fly away and they can't walk away. And then we release the males. They mate, and we look at the frequency of mating by each male type, and that provides a measure of the relative mating ability. We're also gonna be doing some studies in cages, again, to get some more information as we did in 2015 on their mating competitiveness and their longevity. And we'll conduct studies on mating suppression and also population suppression over generations. So hopefully we'll cover really a good amount of what the necessary information for us to decide the next step with this project. We have a lot of safety considerations for the file, for the, for the field trial, and as I mentioned earlier, it was thoroughly evaluated by USDA. What about some of these, these genes that were put into the moss and the proteins that they, that they uh, uh, produce? There's two different proteins, the, the self-limiting protein and the fluorescent protein. And independent evaluations by people at the University of Nebraska, which is the number one place for having this done, they found that there was no allergenetic reaction to them. <clears throat> also, some tests cons confirmed that the consumption of these 
self-limiting insects with these two new proteins, the ingestion by arthropods and fish did not cause any harm. What about movement? You know, there's some concern about movement out of our research trial. We have a very, very isolated field that we're doing this in, surrounded on three sides by woods. And previous studies done in Australia and in our lab indicate that the moth, you know, as long as it has a suitable habitat, it does not move more than 23 meters. Again, the test will be conducted in an isolated field. The field will be sprayed after the trials. And we also know from lots of research that the diamondback moth does not presently, and I emphasize presently, overwinter in upstate New York. With climate change, that may, that may change. So farmers are gonna have more generations to, to deal with. This is the time to do this kind of research. And after an extensive review, USDA issued a comprehensive finding of no significant impact for the trial. So it was thoroughly examined. <clears throat> Let me give you some context about our program. Again, I've been at Geneva for 38 years, and our lab works on, on developing sustainable insect pest management using many different tactics shown in this triangle that, that Jan showed. This is a, an idea of integrated pest management was, which was developed by Vern Stern, who was one of my professors at UC Riverside. Biorational is an important one. And that's what we try and do in our program. So I'd like to leave the audience with a question of how do we manage diamondback moth in an environmentally responsible fashion? This is a picture that a, a grower sent me and said, help me. Thank you.